Hi everyone, I'm Leo Torres, a PhD candidate from the Network Science Institute. A big thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk here today. Today I want to discuss some geometric aspects of mining complex networks. Concretely, I'm going to show you how to take notions and procedures from mathematical fields such as differential geometry and algebraic topology and apply them to develop data mining and machine learning algorithms specifically designed for complex networks. In particular, I want first to talk about graph distances. When you want to compare the structure of two networks, there are literally dozens of available algorithms that all differ in the features they use for comparison, but also in their computational efficiency and interpretability of their results. Not only that, but from a mathematical perspective, the existence of a distance implies the existence of a space called the metric space. These spaces have a ton of geometric properties that are rarely used when discussing the distance between graphs. In a short moment, I will show you our proposal for a graph distance that makes full use of a background theory known as the length spectrum theory. Then I will move on to talk about embeddings. An embedding algorithm finds a vector or a location or a point for each node in the input graph in such a way that the resulting vectors preserve graph structure in one way or another. Similarly to the case of graph distances, these vector spaces have a wealth of geometric properties that are seldom used. For instance, once we have an embedding, we usually compute the distance between two of the node embeddings using cosine similarity, for example, to do such things as link prediction. But vector spaces have a much richer geometry than just distances. You can measure angles and length, you can compute the convex hull of a set of points, or its center of mass, and so on and so forth. So my second example later is going to be of an embedding algorithm that makes use of all of these geometric properties as they apply to the eigenvectors of the Laplacian matrix. So I'm going to go into detail of these two papers here and then take another step back to again look at the general aspect of the geometry of data mining in complex networks. So let's start with graph distances. Let me tell you about the NBD or the non-backtracking distance. This work was done in collaboration with Pablo Suarez Serrato from UNAM in Mexico and my advisor Tina Eliaserrat. This was published in Applied Network Science last year. Spoiler alert, I have found that different people take interest in my work for different reasons. For example, if you're a networks person, then you might be interested in the fact that there exists a matrix called the non-backtracking matrix whose eigenvalues track important features that we network scientists care about such as the degree distribution and the, number, and the number of triangles. These eigenvalues are the cornerstone of the non-backtracking distance. If you're a machine learning person, you should know that these eigenvalues are a great way of measuring distance between two networks. So many machine learning applications require the definition of a distance, sometimes implicitly, for example, clustering or anomaly detection. And I hope to convince you that the NBD is an excellent way of doing just that. If you're a mathematician, you will probably be interested in knowing that the length spectrum of an unweighted graph characterizes its two core uniquely up to isomorphism. So let me start there and tell you what is the length spectrum of a graph. Consider a graph G and a node V that we're going to call the base point. Here's the, the, the node in red. And consider the set of all closed walks that start and end at V. You're going to consider two of these walks as equivalent if they are the same, except perhaps for any tree-like parts that don't go through the base point. And you're going to retain only the shortest walk in each of these sets. It turns out that this is a very common construction in the field of algebraic topology. The set we just defined has the algebraic structure of a group, and it is so important in the theory that it is called the fundamental group of G with base point at V and it's abbreviated as pi1. Now, you could have made a similar construction, but consider instead two walks as being equivalent if they are equal, and say for tree-like parts, period, so without considering the base point. And in this case, you arrive at the set of non-backtracking closed walks, or the non-backtracking cycles. A backtrack is when you move from one node to a neighbor node, and then back to the original node. This always generate tree-like parts or dangling nodes in the walk that you're tracing. So, and, and since we're getting rid of all of the trees, 
whether or not they pass through the base point, then in this second construction, you arrive at the set of closed walks that do not have them, or the set of non-backtracking cycles. Finally, the length spectrum is a function L that is defined on the fundamental group pi1 that takes as input one of those walks and assigns to it the length of its shaved version, so the version of the walk without any trees or backtracks. For example, L of this walk is 3, because after removing the backtrack that in this case goes through the base point, you are left with a triangle whose length is 3. So remember, this function L characterizes the two core of the graph uniquely up to isomorphism. The two core is the subgraph you are left with after iteratively removing all the nodes of degree 1 until there are none. So in essence, the length spectrum contains a ton of information about the graph, and that's why we would like to be able to write something like this. So if we were comparing two graphs G and H, we would like to do that by quantifying the distance uh, between their length spectra functions. But there are two problems here. First, it's not at all clear how I would go about computing the length spectrum of a graph. And second, even if I could do that, it is not at all clear how to compare them. So what we're going to do is focus on the set of outputs instead of an, on the set of inputs. And we're going to partition this set. So let me show you what I mean. Say you want to compare the graphs G and H. And instead of focusing on the set of non-backtracking cycles and on the structure of this fundamental group that they're a part of, we're simply going to count those cycles that have a length of 3, and those that have a length of 4, and 5, and so on and so forth. So now, instead of comparing the length spectra, we're going to compare these histograms that represent the partitioned set of outputs of those functions. Now, there's a myriad ways of comparing two histograms, but we're going to use a particularly clever one that involves the non-backtracking matrix. So let me define that first. The non-backtracking matrix B is a transition matrix of a random walker that does not perform backtracks. Remember, a backtrack is going from one node to a neighbor and then back again. So, for example, if a walker just moved from the red node to the blue node, then the matrix will have a row for the directed edge from red to blue, and a column for the directed edge from blue back to red. The corresponding entry will be zero, meaning that the walker cannot trace a backtrack red, blue, red, whereas other entries for valid steps will be one, for example, from blue to green or from blue to yellow. One of the properties of this matrix is that the diagonal entries of its powers contain the number of non-backtracking cycles, which is exactly what we're trying to compute. So if you take the trace of B cubed, which is the sum of the diagonal entries of the third power, you get exactly the number of non-backtracking cycles of length 3, which is the height of the first bar of the histogram. And then the traces of higher powers give you the other bars. But we can use the eigenvalues of the matrix to compute all of these traces. We don't really need to compute all of the powers of the matrix. So we're going to compare the eigenvalues in order to compare the, to compare the histograms in order to compare the length spectra, in order to compare the two graphs. So this is what finally leads us to the definition of the non-backtracking distance. So if you want to compare two graphs, what you're going to do is compute the largest few eigenvalues of their respective non-backtracking matrices and compare them. In our paper, we use the L2 distance between the empirical spectral densities, but really any other way of comparing the eigenvalues will do. By the way, the non-backtracking matrix is not symmetric, and so in general, their eigenvalues, its eigenvalues are complex numbers, so that's why we need a two-dimensional uh, comparison here, because the eigenvalues are in the complex plane. So I said earlier that these eigenvalues track the structure of the graph, so let me illustrate that. Here, each marker on the plot is one eigenvalue on the complex plane of a graph generated using the, the configuration model. And I'm going to remove the hubs while keeping the overall density constant. And as there are fewer and fewer hubs, the smaller the imaginary part of the eigenvalues. Now let's see what happens with triangles. Here, each marker is one eigenvalue of an erdos renyi graph, to which I'm going to add more and more triangles while keeping the density about the same. What happens here is that the eigenvalues become closer and closer to the real line, and they become more and more positive as well. 
So what all of this means is that important characteristics of the structure of the graph are being codified in the geometric patterns that the eigenvalues form in the complex plane. And that's exactly what we're comparing when we use the non dark tracking distance. So in the plot on the left here, each marker is one eigenvalue of a random graph generated using one of six different kinds of random graph ensembles. And on the right, each marker corresponds to one graph after performing dimensionality reduction on the left plot. So they're color coded by what random graph ensemble was used to generate the graph. So here on the plot on the right, you can cluster the graphs and recover which ensemble was used to generate that graph with up to 99% accuracy. So in our paper, you will find far more extensive experiments that show the usefulness of the NDD in other situations as well. So to recap real quick, the non back tracking eigenvalues codify the structure of the graph, and therefore they are a great way of measuring distance because they contain similar information as the length spectrum which characterizes the two core of the graph uniquely. In terms of geometry, well, the whole derivation and the resulting algorithm are based on algebraic topology, where we are considering the topology intrinsic to each graph separately and using that to compare the two graphs. But also from a different perspective, you can really say that the eigenvalues are actually a form of whole graph embedding. So we're not finding a feature vector for each node, but a feature vector for the whole graph whose coordinates are given by those eigenvalues. So there's a million open questions here about the geometry of the space of graphs induced by the non backtracking distance, as well as the geometry of the space of eigenvalues as they lay out on the, on the, on the complex plane. And these are questions that I would love to continue working on in the future. So let's change gears now and talk about node level embeddings. In particular, let's talk about the geometric Laplacian eigenmap embedding, or GLEE for short. This is work done with Kevin Chen from the Army Research Lab and my advisor, Tina Eliasirad, and was published in the Journal of Complex Networks earlier this year. Spoiler alert, from the math side, what I find most interesting here is that there is a bijection between the set of all undirected, possibly weighted graphs on n nodes and the set of n minus one dimensional simplices. These are geometric simplices, not to be confused with abstract simplicial complexes used in persistent homology, for example. From the network's perspective, we can encode the structure of the graph in geometric terms using the simplex geometry of the Laplacian matrix, and I will explain in a second what this simplex geometry is. And from the machine learning side, we found what we found in the course of this project was that some well-known embedding algorithms perform really well but only when the clustering coefficient of the input graph is high. And I will come back to this point in a second. So let's get right into it. Let me tell you how we get embeddings from the Laplacian matrix of an undirected, possibly weighted graph. So the Laplacian is symmetric and possibly, uh, sorry, and positive semi-definite. So everything works nicely here. And in particular, you can take the eigen decomposition shown here, where the columns of P are the eigenvectors of the matrix L, the Laplacian. But since L is positive semi-definite, the eigenvalues are the same as the singular values. So the theory behind singular value decomposition, SVD, says that if you eliminate the small singular values and the corresponding vectors, you get the best low rank approximation of L. However, the smallest eigenvalue of the Laplacian is always zero, which means that you don't get an approximation, you actually get an exact equality. So now you have this picture. So here you're going to take the square root of the remaining eigenvalues and multiply one copy to the left and one copy to the right. And now the matrix S contains just the rescaled eigenvectors in its columns. So nothing too exciting is happening here. We're just massaging the SVD of the Laplacian. I think what's exciting about this is not in the columns, but in the rows. Because some very smart people before us proved that the rows of this matrix S can be laid out as vectors in n minus one dimensional space, and they will point to the vertices of a geometric shape known as a simplex. A simplex here is just the higher dimensional version of a triangle or a tetrahedron in, in three dimensions, for example. So we just went from the graph to the Laplacian to the simplex, 
But it turns out that from the simplex, you can also fully recover the graph. And that means that every graph theoretical question you can ask about your network can be rephrased as a geometric question about the simplex. And that is exactly the geometry that we're going to use in our embedding. So let me define that embedding real quick. The d-dimensional embedding of a node i is just the first d coordinates of that row of the matrix S that correspond to the largest eigenvalues. So what we're doing here uh, is taking the vertices of the simplex and projecting them down to the first d dimensions. And that's our embedding. Now, I said that from the simplex, you can recover the graph. So let's see how that works. In the case where you have knowledge of the full simplex, then by definition, you can reconstruct the Laplace indirectly by just taking the dot product, S times S transpose. So if you take the dot products of each pair of your embeddings, some of them will equal minus one because that's the, uh, the entries of the Laplacian are all zero or minus one. Uh, and those that are minus one correspond to neighboring nodes. And those that, are co that equal zero correspond to nodes that are not neighbors. But if you have the embedding and you look at the frequency of the dot products, now you will find that there's a bimodal distribution where some of them are close to minus one and some of them are close to zero. So what you want to do is say that those that are left of some threshold theta come from nodes that are neighbors, and those that are to the right of theta are not neighbors. So I won't go into detail here, but in our paper, we provide three different ways of estimating this parameter theta completely automatically in an unsupervised way. So we can compare the performance of, on this task of graph reconstruction against other embedding algorithms. So here, our algorithm Glee is the red line, and this is measuring precision at K, so higher is better. So on the protein-protein interaction network on the left, you can see that we have a vastly better performance than other algorithms, while on the co-authorship network on the right, Glee performs just as well as all the others, and perhaps even a little bit better. So the main difference between these two networks is that the PPI network has very low clustering coefficient, so it kind of seems like the other algorithms are not as stable when the clustering is low. So let's talk about how we do link prediction using Glee and Bennings. This is the part that I wanted to get at because it illustrates how exactly to use the geometry of the simplex. Now, in many networks, we know that the number of common neighbors between two nodes is an excellent predictor of links, and especially in the presence of triadic closure or high clustering coefficient. So with Glee, what you can do to estimate the number of common neighbors between i and j is to take their embeddings, and look at the embeddings of the neighbors of i here in black, and then compute the center of mass of the neighbors of i here in red, and then measure the angle to j, the angle gamma here. So in, in our paper, we proved that this, after some rescaling, is exactly the number of common neighbors when you have the full simplex, and it's a very good approximation when all you have is the projection or the embedding. In the case when your network has a low clustering coefficient, the number of common neighbors is no longer a good predictor of links in general, but the number of paths of length 3 is known to work well sometimes. And so to estimate this, what you can do is something similar as in the previous slide, but now you're going to compute the angle between the center of mass of the neighbors of i to the center of mass of the neighbors of j. Like I said before, every question you may want to ask about the structure of the graph, like number of common neighbors or number of three paths or, or whatever, it becomes a question of the geometry of these embeddings. And I think there is so much more that can be said and done in this space, not only with Glee embeddings, but with the geometry of the embeddings computed by any other algorithm. So similarly as before, in general, the lower the clustering coefficient of the network, the better the performance of Glee and the worse the performance of some of the other algorithms. And I think the main point here is that Glee is not really trying to optimize some kind of objective function. Instead, Glee is trying to find a direct geometric encoding of the whole of the graph structure, whatever the graph looks like, while other algorithms are making assumptions about the structure, like high clustering, for example, and it seems like their objective functions are perhaps a little sensitive to those assumptions. So quick recap. There is a bijection between undirected graphs and simplices, and therefore we can encode the structure of the graph in geometric terms using Glee. 
whereas other algorithms are usually making assumptions as to what the graph, the graph looks like. In terms of geometry, I would like to know what else we can do with the geometry of embeddings. We have only scraped the, sur the surface here. So usually when we get embeddings, we compute the cosine similarity between two embeddings, and that's about it. But what about all the angles and centers of mass and other geometric constructions that we were doing for Glee? So how can graphs be encoded geometrically and meaningfully is the question of the whole talk, basically. And this is a far broader question than it may seem at first, because here we have been talking about Euclidean geometry, but what about the Riemannian geometry and hyperbolic spaces, for example, or other kinds of manifolds? In fact, there are numerous algorithms for manifold learning for other kinds of data. So why don't we do the same for graphs? My belief is that every procedure or new idea that allows us to reframe graph theoretical questions in geometric terms is a huge opportunity for graph mining and machine learning on, on graphs. Let me quickly mention a couple of the other projects that I've been working on. The whole idea of perturbing a network or changing its structure little by little can also be recast in geometric terms. Note that we always do this when we talk about generative models and network growth, which is adding nodes to the network one by one, or network robustness or percolation, which is removing nodes or edges one by one. The whole point here is that whether your network lives in a metric space or your nodes have been embedded in a vector space, every small perturbation of the graph's structure is tantamount to a small perturbation of the geometry of the underlying space. So every question of the type, what happens to the graph after this small change, can be rephrased as what happens to the geometry of the space when I move by a step of one epsilon. The first paper on the left is precisely about one of those questions. What happens to the leading eigenvalue of the non-backtracking matrix when a node is removed from the graph, for example, for node immunization purposes? I am presenting this work on Monday at poster session number one from 1830 to 1900 hours, uh, Central European time. If you are interested, please drop by that session. The second paper on the right studies the setting where a malicious adversary is trying to perturb the structure of the network in order to enhance the spreading of a certain dynamics on a particular target subgraph rather than on the whole network. And you can find this paper on the archive. A quick final note, I've been talking about geometry and topology this whole time, but the algorithms actually ended up being about eigenvalues. Eigenvalues of the Laplacian matrix or of the non-backtracking matrix. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think that whenever we're trying to apply differential geometry to graphs in one way or another, well, graphs are discrete structures, they're not differential. And, and when we're trying to apply notions from algebraic topology, well, there is a huge combinatorial explosion in these fundamental groups that I mentioned before. So in both cases, you need to have some kind of intermediary that allows you to bridge the gap in order to have tractable algorithms that still make use of that underlying geometry and topology. And I think that eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices are one very attractive alternative in that case. So in the future, I would like to keep thinking about how to use spectral methods to bridge the gap between geometry and topology on the one hand and data mining of complex networks on the other. And on that note, let me finish by saying that I am currently looking for my next position as a postdoc or assistant professor, primarily in Europe, and I would love to keep working on these topics. So if you know of any opportunity, please let's get in touch. Thanks.